know what's in your heart and just do it and don't care what anybody else says or doesn't say if you have it in your heart and you'll sorry it's you'll okay. know you will know <laughs> Okay, so here we are with Paddy Mark, the founder of Animal Liberation Victoria and long-term vegan. I think you've been vegan for about 30 years. Mm. Amazing. Really honored to have this interview with you. You've done a lot for the movement and you're really an animal rights legend. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you. Thanks. And we're here on your amazing little um, abode here with all the amazing creatures here you live with. Yep, there's about 85 animals here. It's our sanctu uh, liberation sanctuary. Amazing. Yeah. And it must feel good to sort of be taking a step back now and looking after all these animals, but there's a lot of work associated with just having this amount of friends around <laughs> to look <laughs> well, after. <laughs> I'm really living the dream. I can't believe this has happened to me. After all these years of working for the animals, now I get to be just be with them all the time. But yeah, it's a lot of work. <laughs> Beautiful out here. So I just want to... Well, I wanted to introduce you to my following because there's a lot of new vegans that might not have... Well, we, we didn't know what was going on back then. A lot of people were, you were operating before a lot of my following might have been born. And I just wanted to introduce you because you've got a lot of knowledge. And I just wanted to start at the beginning. Like, how did you get involved with animal rights? Well, I guess the first sort of step was I went vegetarian on my husband and I bicycled he was Australian that's how I got here we bicycled overland in 1974 from England to Australia and I was a big animal lover I loved animals but didn't realize um, I ate them and we were in the outbacks of Greece on a really rural road there was um, dirt road but cycling along there was a flock of goats with their kids and I said stop stop and they were, you know what kids are so cute <laughs> so we stopped and we interacted with these goats for a good half hour and I was in heaven and then shortly after we stopped at a little village at a roadside cafe a tarpaulin over three big cauldrons and we didn't speak Greek so when he lifted the lid we were just going to point to which which what meal we wanted and when he lifted one of the lids it was goat's head soup Oh my and God. it had the, the goat's head in it. And it's like, wow, everything. I was 24 years old. Everything just exploded. And I got chills now. It was like, wow, I'm eating these animals who I love. And I went vegetarian on the spot. Wow. Except for fish. I don't okay. know why. I still felt fish might be a, I don't know. But I added fish as soon as we got to Australia. And I saw a huge shark taken um in, on the south coast of Victoria at, Ferry, at Port Ferry, this amazing creature. She was at least um, probably 10 foot long. Mm -hmm. And when I saw her, that was shortly when I, we got to Australia, that clicked too. I said, oh, they're, they're animals as well. Yeah. So you made the connection by seeing the head of the animal, which most people don't get to see. They see the package and they see the yes. flesh. And... and her eye. The eye is what went right through me. Wow. The eye would have been as big as a, um, a plum. It was this huge, and it was just looking back at me, and it was just, um, yeah. So it was easy for you to make the connection and switch completely, but I guess back then there wasn't the information on the dairy or egg industry. No, so. I, I didn't even, um, there, no idea of, ve of veganism at, uh, at all. Mm. Um, and I didn't even, even when I first met my first vegan, I, was, I pronounced it vegan. I didn't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> and um, they were very thin people and mm. pale and, and I didn't even question them much. And that would have been probably in the early 80s. Okay. And, but then in 1984, I went with the government um, in the, to a feedlot, dairy, beef and dairy feedlot. Mm -hmm. And I saw how... Um, Again, that's how ignorant I was. I didn't even know female cows had horns. So this, what they did then, they would take off the horns because they got in the way in the milking shed. They had a big hydraulic press, like a big giant secretaire. And okay. I remember standing there and he, no pain relief at all. Okay. Cut, and that cow just screamed. And the blood spurt at least um, three meters away like a hose and oh I said God. oh how long does that bleed and he said it still drips after 12 hours it doesn't shoot up but it's still dripping after 12 hours and her screams went right through me and so I went vegan then that was 1984 but I didn't last there was no like I said I met maybe a, two a husband and wife team but there was no other knowledge of veganism at all 
And the only, it's the, I remember I got what's called Robert's Soya Compound. It was a p- white powder to make soy milk. Soy milk. <laughs> you had to shake it like crazy. And that was the only um, that alternative was, to dairy. Yeah. <laughs> and I had two children who I brought up vegetarian. And so they were still having cheese pizzas. Mm-hmm. And cheese is addictive. It yeah. actually is addictive. And they wouldn't finish their pizzas. And after about six months of me being a vegan, vegan i thought oh i can't let this food go to waste so i would slip up yeah but then in around 1990 is when my son who was 15 he went vegan he did a lot of reading and he was a good vegetarian and he said mom i'm going vegan this is bad i says oh it is okay good i'll do it with you and then having the vegan in the household it worked a treat a support network a yes. support system yes yeah. but i'm so ashamed to think that it took me all that time from eight um which now there's no other thing in the world yeah. I'd rather be than a vegan. <laughs> well, from your veganism, where did that sort of evolve into animal rights activism? Oh, okay. Well, then um, when I was still, shortly after coming to Australia, I had two children that ride in a row, 77, okay. uh, 76, 77. Okay. And then in 78, um, I had read some books and it was about the battery cage. Yep. And I grew up in the Midwest USA, which is called the breadbasket of the world. And okay. it's where factory farming started. Okay. Um, and yet I was so, didn't know anything, you know, it never clicked. So in this book, it was talking about the four hens and the little tiny cages. And well, the, and I thought, how can anyone lock four little birds up in these cages, row after row, tears high? It just really, really got to me. Yeah. Um, and so I, um, I wrote, actually I wrote to Peter Singer and I said, C- um, what can I do to help? It was his book, Animal Liberation. Wow. So he said, he gave me the names of two people in, a, in Melbourne that I could write to that had animal rights groups. One was with dogs and cats and one was with lab animals. But, and I said, I want to work for farmed animals because there was no- nothing at all. This is um, 1978. Wow. Um, and they kept saying, oh, yeah, we can do that, we can do but nothing happened. And then I was at the library one day, and there was a women's magazine, and it said thumbs up to the group in Sydney called Animal Liberation, working for farmed animals. Wow. So I wrote to, um, that was Chris Townen. I wrote to her. We started a really good correspondence, and after a few months, she says, Patty, why don't you start up a group in Melbourne? <laughs> and I said, me? <laughs> you know, I, I wasn't, a, um, I'm generally an introvert, yeah. But when it comes to animals, for some reason, there's no stopping me. Wow. And um, so I put a note in my local milk bar. For those that don't know, milk bar is like a delicatessen. Yep. Um, and I can remember writing on just on an A4 sheet of paper, help the hens. Wow. And my address and the time and place. It was December 7th, 1978. And... A local journalist picked it up in the Herald Sun as an oddity and said, oh, what next? Help the hens. And But it got space in the widest wow. circulation newspaper in Victoria. And 17 people showed up at my lounge room. And that's how Animal Liberation Victoria started. Wow. Yeah. And so it was like a, an ad in the newspaper that reached out to... The, lo- whole, the, whole, the whole state, yeah. But it was just a little post-up note in the milk, local milk bar. <laughs> Amazing. And it, what's interesting to me is some people come in, involved with animal rights activism before they're a vegan. Were the 17 people that um, come to you mm. when you put this ad in the paper, yes. were they all vegan? Or? Oh, no, no. I wasn't even vegan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you were a vegetarian yes, when you got into animal rights activism. Yeah. And I doubt that many of those people were even vegetarian, but they didn't like the idea of four birds in a cage. Wow. So, um, and, and yeah, it's... um. It's interesting that people, the more they know, myself included, mm. the more we learn and know what happens, there's no turning back. Wow. No turning back. That's amazing. So yeah. there is a lot of animal lovers out there that aren't yet vegan. So these are the ones who are going to turn into the activists of tomorrow. Yes. And you're living proof of that. Yes. So, yes. So how did Animal Liberation Victoria evolve? I mean, you might, might have started small. Did you start rescuing animals? Or? Yeah, no, that's the interesting part of the story. We started by... Um, all through the 80s mostly uh, we were uh, how will i uh, good little people we yeah. i had a lot of contact with the local department of ag they'd take me anywhere i'd ask to go i had read a study on dark cutting in in cows from an abattoir so i said well that proves they're stressed so i i asked the department of ag could you take me to the abattoirs because i wanted to then prove that these animals are stressed mm-hmm. it sounds ridiculous now of course they're stressed but 
But so they set up eight abattoir visits for me. Or they, they took me to the beef and dairy feedlot. They take me to battery hen sheds. So I did all these things and I sat down with the producers and chatted with them as if, can we improve it? It was all welfare. Yeah. I had no idea back then of abolition. Yeah. And, um, and we'd work really hard. We'd have street marches, petitions out of our, coming out of our ears, tabling in the malls. We spo- I spoke at a lot of schools. This was all through the early, up through the 80s. Um, but nothing that was like we do that that we did later and then so come the the 90s um and we had campaigned so so much and we had so much we did have a lot of media at first because it was such a new thing there were no farmed animal groups so then in the early 90s i got a call from a woman that worked in a battery hen factory Mm -hmm. up near the border of new south wales okay and what she told me i just couldn't even understand what she was talking about she mentioned manure pits and hens mm. fall in the manure pits. And at lunchtime, the other workers use them as target practice and they're starving to death. And I just, I thought, oh, what do you mean manure pits? Yeah. And, um, and they, at the outside, they, at the end of the aisles, they put four hens in each cage, but at, toward the back, it's seven to eight hens in each cage. Wow. It just sounded appalling. So I had a friend that I knew go up there to work to see if she was telling what she was talking about and he confirmed it all so then uh, i had a really close friend diana simpson who was so brave and she lived in the area and she said i'll go in and take some footage and i said you will (laughs) i'll I'll be forever grateful to that woman so she went in by herself into the manure manure pit which what it is the hens were on the first floor yeah on the and all and the the ground floor was all enclosed, yep. and all their ex, all their feces came down into huge mounds that were six, as tall as me, six foot tall, under the cages. And then where the aisles were, there you could walk up and down. And she went in there by herself <sighs> and filmed it and brought it to me. And um, it was just so horrible. Mm. Something just I just said there she was filmed. There were piles of dead and dying hens around the manure the with some of the water nipples leaked and there was a slurry of mm. of um it was a slurry of of feces mm. and they were trying to drink that there were dead birds caught in it and in the mounds there were birds just sitting there with their combs totally over their faces i just was totally devastated and i remember i just said die we have to go in there we have to go get them out mm. It was like, at that point, I'd had countless meetings, I think, with every single minister for agriculture. So um, You felt you weren't getting anywhere with them, we, so you wanted to take your own action. We weren't getting anywhere with them, but because yeah. I, I thought, there's, and what is happening there is so wrong. We're just going to go in and we're going to get them out. Yep. And at that point, there was a really, uh, uh, Darren Hinch, okay. he had his own program on national TV. He was really big, at, um, Hinch at Seven, it was called. And I had contacts with him from other media I had done with him. So I called him up and I told him about the footage, showed it to him. And I said, look, we're going to, I'm just going to get some people. We're going to go in and we're going to get them out. Yep. And he said, he was surprised. He says, okay, I'll send a team in with you. <sighs> so he did. I remember a, a he media sent team. a media team oh my went God. with us. And that is what we call the first open rescue. Um, he had a reporter, a camera person and a guy that holds the big boom. Okay. And I remember they, the reporter was this tiny, petite, a really lovely lady. They piggybacked her across the paddock. Wow. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so we went in and we filmed and we, we rescued from memory 21 hens. And, um, and it made, and he then called it the Dungeons of Alpine Poultry. And it was on national TV and it just opened everything up. There was, so, and, and that was in um, March 1993. And of course, we were, oh, back in those days, a private citizen could take a cruelty prosecution. So, and it was, it, that was in New South Wales. And this property was right across the border in New South Wales. Okay. So um, I prosecuted, myself prosecuted the farmer for cruelty to animals. Amazing. And so, yeah, we thought, oh, this is going to be a test case. It's going to end factor. It's going to end the battery cage. We were so excited. We fundraised. We got lots of money. We hired the best barrister we could find. We, we flew over two experts from England, from yep. London, and had the whole thing set up. And it was in the Albury Courthouse in 1994 by the time it went to court. And um, 
when we got there, the, they had what's called a voir dire, a case inside a case. And the, um, the defense, so the battery farmer then was before the courts, not me. Okay. He, his, his legal team said, oh, they asked the magistrate that the evidence I had was not admissible because it was illegally obtained. So they had this whole day in court arguing that point, and I lo- we lost it. Uh-huh. So the magistrate said, no, you can't use any of your footage, and it was shocking footage, horrible. And you cannot imagine how I felt, because that's all, all our evidence was, yeah. um, was that footage. And um, to make a long story short, I had to drop all the charges, and the hardest thing, one of the hardest things I've ever done, I had to sign that document. I drop all the charges. Mm-hmm. And then they, um, the court awarded costs to him. So I w- was ordered to pay him $25,000. court fees and all of that. Yeah, all his legal fees. Um, oh and, of course, I didn't have any money. I was a young mother then. And um, um, we were paying off a house in one salary family. We, I, we had hardly had any money. And so I had... To offer to work, he had three factory farms. So I, he had one near me in Victoria. I says I'll have to work it off at your factory farm. Oh my god! <laughs> it worked. He agreed. <laughs> no, he he didn't. Of course, he didn't want me there because okay, because you'd be liberating all, all these evidence, animals. No, all the evidence would have been admissible. <laughs> okay. Oh, I, I get was it. Because I working there. I get it. Yeah, that yeah. was 1994. Wow. Yeah. So no, I never heard another thing. So how did it feel that day? It would have felt like, well, justice hasn't been served here today. Mm. I mean, you got off of off of paying the court fees, mm. but that must have ripped your heart oh, out. Oh, it did. It was like I said. I just was. I could not put my hand to sign that paper. I was just. I can still feel how my hand felt. That I can't. I can't just let all these birds down. That. But. But then we did get so much media, and that started. We have since then done hundreds of these open mm. rescues at night. And um, in the first five or t- five or eight years, we had heaps of media because it was a fairly new thing. Mm. And again, as time goes, it becomes old news. You always got to get get something different to get the media to mm. come. Yeah. But it really, um, at the time, nobody had seen inside these sheds. Nobody knew what was going on in there. Yeah. Yep. This is the 90s. There's no internet. There's no, um, no. what do you call it? Phones, Facebook. Facebook, <laughs> social media. Yeah. yeah. It Imagine. was a whole different world back then. Do you feel like from that, that first open rescue and feeling that injustice of you know n- not prosecuting this man, did that drive you going forward? Was that fuel? Like, did that drive your passion going forward, trying to get that retribution? You know? Well, well n- not so much because there's so many of these farms. We went to one of them that was a real ta- mm. real really got to me was called happy hen's egg world Mm. we did at least 30 rescues there and they were strict catholics and i was brought up strict catholic i'm not anymore Mm. but um but they had a lit up crucifix with lights in the paddock next to the sheds they had nine horrible sheds and then i could go on and on all the different uh, fact fact we call them factory farms then Mm. again i didn't I wasn't using the word animal agriculture, which is what we have to say. It's not about factory farms. It's about animal agriculture. But in those days, it was still factory farming. And and we would still measure the cages. We would still try to say this is against the law, the code of practice. I get it. You've got... You've got eight hens and there should be four. That's how okay. we would... There's actually footage of me measuring cage after cage. Whereas the real change to ALV and to all our work happened in the late 90s when I started to read the work of Gary Francione, okay. who was a professor of law at Rutgers University. Mm-hmm. And I read some of his work and it was like, wow, this yeah. is... It just... It, what was in my heart then crystallized in my mind what the whole movement should be about. Yeah. So it's not about making things better and about, um, yeah, we, we can make life better for them. It'd be like the slave trade in, in the United States. Exactly. Let's give mm-hmm. them a hot meal on Sundays or we'll teach their kids to read. It's, mm-hmm. it's, not, it's not about welfare at all. Mm. And it was like my whole world opened up then and we actually changed our constitution at the time and ALV then became an abolitionist animal rights organization. <laughs> Amazing. But we were the only one, and we were really marginalized. We were really became, oh, my God, they're fanatics, they're extremists by the rest of the movement, which was really hard yeah. at the time. Well, what's really wonderful is now the movement is that, you it's, know, nobody's... largely, is, is yes. mostly 
abolitionist. Yes, and, yeah, absolutely. I'd say it basically is. You don't see a- activist groups now saying, "Let's fix, let's make the cage bigger." No, just that's to me one of the most gratifying things, the changes that I've seen to date. Mm. That all these. You know, so many, so many good people out there working so hard for yeah. animals, and but they used to really think, what you're doing, you're going to put the public off. It's too much. They're not going to understand, and the whole people will never stop eating meat. They'll never go vegan. And we were ostracized. Yeah. We really were, and it was nobody likes to be ostracized. No. But um, to see that change is just, uh, it's. It, it's so um, makes me so happy because mm. it's where the movement needs to be, yeah. and it's there. <laughs> so in your heart, you felt like you were doing the right thing, but you were being ostracized for doing the right thing. Yes. Yeah. Oh, quite quite a lot. I remember I started a, ma- a animal rights magazine when, well, animal welfare magazine it was called Outcry in 1980, and I edited and the name changed a few times, but I edited that up into um, oh, late 90s. And then they thought it was getting too radical by the time I started to put abolitionist stuff in it. And it used to be circulated to most of the groups in Australia. They, did, they didn't want it. And some people said, oh, no, we want a different magazine. It's too, they just thought it was too radical. So stuff like, it was just, but, but um, I'm glad I felt, I felt so strong. Be, I think because I'd been in all these sheds, I'd seen firsthand what these animals are going through. And there's no way to fix it up. There's no. just no way. No. So I think the fact that I'd seen it all firsthand myself yeah. is what um, made me just say no. <laughs> yeah, a- abolition just makes sense, doesn't it? There's no oh. humane way to, to exploit, or mm-hmm. it's like the way we view the animals, isn't it? Like if you're viewing them as a resource and an object and something to make money from and a commodity, then they can never be ever they can never be treated like an individual, can they? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, and I'm so glad when I came across all that because it's just. To me now, it's just so straightforward. But mm. it's um. But again, it wasn't around back in the late '90s at all. It was um. Well, I guess because most people, you know, well, we still have a long way to go. We really still have a long way to go. Mm. But there's more and more people working so hard. There's so it's many amazing. amazing groups and activists out there now. It's just so, so exciting. It must be so <laughs> amazing to to walk in a supermarket and see all the different oh. options and coming from your powdered soya milk that you're <laughs> mixing up and going, oh, what is this stuff? <laughs> you know? well, not only that, when, when we started, I remember the 17 people in my lounge room, I remember saying to them at the time, I said, because I, I sort of wanted to, to not to let them know it might take us a while i says look guys it could take us two years till we ban the cage that's Mm. how naive i was Mm. i really thought we would have the battery cage banned in two years Mm. that was 1978 and then our main aim was to back then free range eggs weren't available in the supermarkets Mm -hmm. because the victorian egg board had a levy Mm -hmm. and you had to get so many uh you had to have permission from the egg board to sell your eggs Mm -hmm. and the free range farmers just couldn't get any. So you, there was no access to free range eggs. So our main goal in the early eighties was to get free range eggs in the supermarket. Wow. That's what we worked our guts out for that. And then when I think back and then it clicked, all we're doing is creating another animal industry. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I've seen it so clearly as the years progress that we were just adding to the problem. Mm-hmm. And that's why when I um, totally understood and, abolition and how important it was that um yeah and then i know other other animal groups were still doing the free range eggs and i used to waste i'll be honest i wasted a lot of my anger and energy on getting frustrated with other groups of why are you doing this you know why are you doing this um i guess i had to think i used to do that too but but once you know you just think come on (laughs) yeah but i did get really i used to get so frustrated (laughs) Yeah, one of the things for me is I feel like the, the, the welfare movement holds holds everything back. There are some theories that, um, you know, uh, welfare is a road to veganism. But for me, I feel like the welfare movement holds it back because it makes people comfortable with continuing to mm. consume the animal products. Yes, yeah. I totally agree. It took me a while to learn that too. Yeah. And, and I would get, that's where the frustration came. I said... Our rescue teams then started to go into the RSPCA approved sheds and yeah. the, the farms that were humane and the top top stars and and they were just as appalling. I'll be honest, every bit is appalling. Like the the barn laid sheds, there'd be thousands of birds together cannibalizing each other. It's some of the worst cruelty I've seen have been in the RSPCA approved sheds yeah. and piggeries and 
across the board. So there's no such thing as as humane and making mm-hmm. it better. Yeah. But also when I was with in the first few years of ALV, we worked so so hard to get free range eggs available, and then it hit me that oh, we've just created another animal industry. Because yeah. I kept up with all the statistics, there were just as many hens still locked up in cages when we had free-range eggs. Yeah. And, and now you can get free-range eggs anywhere, obviously, yeah. and barn laid and the whole thing. So it's not solving any problems. It's just creating a larger industry. Yeah, definitely. And for you, so, so moving through the 90s, you then progressed into the year 2000 and then social media come around. Yes. And how has social media changed the movement as a whole, do you think? Has it, had a, has it been instrumental? Oh, Facebook and YouTube yeah. and access to information. And now you've got more of a platform to share these yes, rescues but, but on. But then most of our open rescues were in the 90s and the noughties. And I don't even remember when I started doing Facebook. I, I wasn't familiar. Mm. I'm not very technologically minded. Okay. I remember my sister kept saying, you should get on this Facebook. I said, what's Facebook? I didn't know much about it. So I can't even remember... It, when, it, when it came into when play. When it came in, yeah. So it's very recent, isn't it? Yeah. It's very recent. I just remember I had so many contacts around the world. We used to write letters to each other, in, like snail mail in the, in the 80s and that. And, um, and then we started, the emails came in, I know, in the 90s and the mid-90s. And so I had a whole lot of um, contacts in different countries overseas, and we'd email all the time. And I do remember when social media happened, the emails sort of stopped, and everybody was more on, on Facebook, and a thing called MySpace. That's okay. right, MySpace. Yes. And um, and, and by the time I got familiar with all that, then the, I found everything had changed. The whole communication in the movement had started to change, mm. and um, people were relating more on social media. Wow. So what for you has been some of the most memorable times, uh, say, uh, the most memorable instances with certain animals or anyone you had to leave behind? What, what sticks out the most for you? Oh, wow. I, mean, I know there's been a lot. Yeah. Okay. I, I could probably pick an animal from every category. Um, one of the ones that really stole my heart, though, was a battery hen called Jess that we rescued from Wagner's poultry farm, which I had been at 25 years before we rescued her. So if you can imagine, that farm's been there that whole time, wow. and I go back 25 years later. And it was, um, it was pretty bad when I first went in. And so um, Jess would have been rescued because I was in court for her in 2016. So it would have been probably around 20, 15, 2014 or 15. And the place was even more run down. The back fences were collapsed. Everything was a mess. The shed was totally open. Half the cages were just empty and derelict full of cobwebs. And so we went in and, um, and it was quite dangerous because they had taken out a whole row of cages. So there was this like 10 foot drop that even, they just had to walk along this narrow ledge to the cages to check the birds. And so we we got quite a few hens out that night, but um, Jess was massive. She was like this massive hen with her abdomen extended. And um, we took her to the vet the next day and the the avian specialist, because I'd never seen anything like it before. And I can remember as sick as she was, she was still, it was a hot day, she was eating watermelon outside the vet. So I thought, well, there's hope for you, sweetheart, you know? And we went in, and the vet was so sweet. She said, um, look, Patty, it's, if, it's, um, if it's a tumor, there's no hope. But if it's pus, we'll try, to, we'll try our best. But she's too weak to operate on now. Mm-hmm. So we'll, um, we'll let her rest here in the surgery for three, three days, I think she said. Mm-hmm. I said, OK. And then um, the day before the surgery, the, uh, the other vet called me and he said, it's cruel to keep this bird alive. She's just so weak. And I said, oh, okay, but, I th- but so the other vet said there was hope. And he says, yeah, but she's just getting worse and worse. And oh, I was so sad because mm-hmm. I had farmed a, um, a bond with her already. Mm-hmm. And um, so it was so hard for me to say to him, okay, okay, do it. But I did and I got off the phone, I just burst into tears. And there was a few people in the office, and they heard me, and they said, what's wrong? And I told them. And they said, well, if they're going to euthanize her, tell her to do the surgery as well. 
I said, oh, of course. So I quickly called him back, and I said, oh, hi, is she still, have you done it? He said, no. I says, well, look, if you're going to euthanize her, can you just try the surgery? Yeah. And he said, yeah, I guess, okay. Mm -hmm. And it was a success. Wow. And she lost more than half her body weight in pus. <laughs> Oh my God! It was just there's photos of it. We've done bill. I think there's a billboard with Jess, and um, you would not believe the difference in that hen. And um, she was so sweet. And as she, she and she kept eating her watermelon, and she got stronger and stronger. And if you saw a before and after picture, you would not believe your eyes. Wow. And we were so bonded. She knew uh, um, they hens are so intelligent, and they really they like our dogs and cats once you get to know them. <laughs> Speaking of dogs, yes, who's this in here? <laughs> that's Rosie. Rosie. Rosie's, Rosie's jumping in on the podcast. We can let her in <laughs> yeah, if you come want. Yeah, come on. Come on, Rosie. I'll we'll have to open the door. Yeah, oh. Yeah. Come on. Come on. And, jo and Is Maddie. that okay to leave yeah. her lover? Yeah, that's fine. Oh, Rosie's joined the chat. Yeah, so... So Je so she got she was so friendly. She got to know where my bed was. She would come in and roost on my bed. Yeah. Every day I would come. I knew where she was. She'd come and sit on my bed. Beautiful. Do you think oh. she knew you were... You took you saved her. You, you. Oh, I'm not sure. I just think we knew each other and we we really cared about each other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she was very safe special. With you. Yeah, safe with you. And there'd be stories like that with the pigs we've rescued. Some some have made it. One of the pigs we have here at the sanctuary. I actually lift. She's Chloe. She's ten years old this year. Wow. I actually lifted her out of a piggery ten years ago with this massive deformed leg. She couldn't even walk. She, uh, she had about five vet visits. Oh, here's the kitten. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> she had about five vet, vet visits. And so and she had really, we, she got foster cares because I wasn't allowed pigs where I lived then. And they were so good to her and they got her walking again. And then um, they came on to difficult times and their sanctuary shut down. So ironically, then I have this place. And they said they needed a home for her, so I was so excited. So she's back yeah. with me again. Amazing. She's been here for a couple of years now, and she's Amazing. yeah. So that's um, that's a real joy. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And you've got some uh, dairy cows here as well. Yes, we've done. Uh, we have a dairy cow, and we also got several bobby calves, which were rescued when they go um, to. Um, they kill them when they're only five days old. Yeah. So we've rescued quite a few of them, and. Um, we bottle feed them, and again, I used to have to. We used to rehome them because I lived in the city, mm -hmm. but now they can live here. Wow. And we have a. Do you want to hear about Mabel? Yes, yeah. yes. And um, so that was in I think October 2018. So a bit over a year ago, we got a call that the two, these two wonderful activists were negotiating with a dairy farmer on the, way far from here um, to rehome his cows because the wife wanted out. Yeah. And so, and then they were talking about their neighbor had this little cat, this little calf. It turns out, well, anyway, they had this little calf, and it was so pitiful. She had been kept in a tiny concrete enclosure that had a dead rotting sheep in it and feces. Um, How awful! And she had pneumonia. She her eyes were pussed shut and bulging. She couldn't see properly and covered in lice. She was really sick, and he was keeping her to flush her eggs because her mother was a good milker. Wow. So because he knew she wasn't going to survive, he was thinking, I'll wait and flush her eggs. For the genetics? To keep the genetics yes, because, for her mother? Yes, because the mother was such a good milker, so it would have made, more, it was more profitable for him to use her eggs it, from the genetics of the mother, and, um, and then she would have just, he would have killed her. So she he didn't died. care about her no. as far as, only the no, eggs as far was, as the profit for him. That's she it. wasn't treated for any of those conditions. She, yeah, the vet visit, she had pneumonia, covered in lice, and, um, and the eyes were the real problem. She still has scarring on her eyes, but she now has partial vision. And, um, and she's just, we've called her Mabel, and she's so sweet. And so luckily they did... Um, um, give her. They did let the girls have her, yep. have her, so she was free finally. And um, yeah, and she's just we we all love her. She's so sweet. She's okay today. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she's big and bold. Beautiful. <laughs> so for a lot of people might not know why they kill the bobby calves so young in the dairy industry. You just want to explain a bit about that for people who might be new and. 
Yeah, sure. Um, well, people, I was one of those people. Yeah. I just thought, well, cows don't have to die. Yeah. We can drink, and if you don't milk them, they're going to explode. Yeah. And I, I really believed all that for years. Yeah. But, you know, they only, it's like every mammal, like human, like us, because I'm, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother. <laughs> but um, so a mammal has milk to feed their own baby, not somebody else's. Yeah. So when, when the cows have the dairy, the modern day dairy cows, they're never allowed to suckle their babies. Their babies are taken away because they're put on the milking machine. And any mother who's hearing this will know the more your baby suckles, the more milk you produce. Okay. Yeah. So if you're, if you have a really hungry baby and they're suckling a lot, you're going to have a lot of milk. At least that's what happened with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and the same with cows. So they put them on these machines and they milk them, milk them. So where they used to maybe milk them once a day, now they milk them three times a day and the milk volume has just increased just because they're pumping them more. I get it. And they, and the, their little babies aren't allowed to suckle at all. Yeah. Um, perhaps from colostrum the first day, and the females are kept to replace their moms in the herd, and the males are all killed at bef before they reach five days of age, wow. generally, unless some, a few are kept out to raise for um, veal or for they're killed um, a bit later. But the majority are killed when they're only five days old. It's just yeah. so sad. Yeah, it's horrible. Any babies yeah. and. To you being a mother, maternal, you, you understand that on such a deep level. Oh, very much so. Mm. And when, um, yeah, and I would like to think every mother, but for some reason they don't. I'm, um, that's one big mystery I have to this day that a mother who real, they know what mother wouldn't die for her baby. Yeah. I know you would do anything for your baby, and cows are the same. Yeah. Um, they just. I've heard of that I've been in the country where they bellow for days yeah. when their babies are taken away and yeah. vice versa. So, um, and for, for, in the women's movement and women's rights and feminists, we, we should be, every feminist should be the one standing tall and proud for the rights of these mothers yes. who are just so violated, of so course. horribly violated. The, the whole animal agriculture industry is built off the sexual exploitation of animals can oh. you talk a little bit about the sexual abuse that goes on in the industry because i know you um i'm running a campaign mm. uh, while we're doing this podcast on uh sexual abuse across the board right. there's a lot of aspects of this that people don't uh that, that that really even in the animal rights movement is really little uh little known and one of those things which is separate to dairy obviously but you were talking about the parent hens and i took a, a little clip of you in a parent shed oh, yeah. um can you just outline a few different aspects? Let's talk about the, the, the parent hens, and then we can talk about maybe the sexual abuse in the dairy industry, and then there's okay. the stud boars in the pork industry. And just what you know and what you found uh, particularly d disturbing. Right, okay, yeah, with, with the, the parent birds, for instance. Here is someone I thought I knew just about everything there was to know in the industry, yeah. and I didn't. I think it was um, in the early 2000s. Yeah where I, I, all of a sudden um, I came across a parent bird farm and I thought, wow, what did you think, Patty? They fell from the sky? Yeah. <laughs> it never crossed my mind. Yeah. So we were doing a, an RSPCA approved shed that night and the birds had been depopulated. I get it. So we were all there, there were no birds, yeah. but we heard these horrible noises. Like uh, somebody said, I think it's some guy's radio because it was a paddock with a little caravan in yeah. it. Um, but I, we thought this is radio and he's what, some sort of horror story, but it was horrible noise, but it wasn't. So we got back in our rescue van and we, we just followed the noise. Yeah. And um, it was only about a kilometer away. And when we got there, you could hear the birds screaming inside and all the lights were on. It would have been like 1 a.m. Mm -hmm. So we went in there instead. We're very peaceful, nonviolent. We do full biosecure. Mm -hmm. So we got in, in the first, there was a little ante room where we changed into our gear and disinfected. And when I opened that door, I thought, oh my God, it was just, I, I was expecting a free, uh, a barn laid shed like the RSPCA approved ones. Yeah. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. There, in that particular place, there was, um, I found out five hens to every one rooster. So it was filled with roosters and hens and they were being repetitively mated nonstop mm. at one in the morning. The hens were screaming. Um, we, we had to wade through them. It was just so pitiful. 
many of the hens had no feathers on their back. They were red raw. And the roosters, I, I must admit, I had to feel sorry for them. They were just exhausted yeah. um, and not in good shape at all. And so we, did, we took a lot of footage and got that. And then when I, when I um, did further research, I found out what's called spiking in the industry, mm -hmm. where when the, the roosters, because that, in that place it was five hands to every rooster, they get so exhausted at about 40 weeks, because they're in there 60 weeks. But at 40 weeks, they, take, they kill all the roosters, and they put new young roosters in to keep going the hens until they're all depopulated at 60 weeks. And their eggs are for um, the, the egg industry. Another reason why we said you can't support free-range eggs. Yeah. That's their, th those are their parents. They come from parent hens, don't yes. they? Yes. Yeah. And those sheds are, to me, they're worse than the yeah. barn laid in the, f even it works in the cage. Yeah. It was just, it was like out of Dante's hell. It was just a horrible place. That's creating this environment where hens can't escape roosters and then they're mm. putting sexually active roosters in with these exhausted hens. hens and yeah. There's nothing natural about this process. No. This is creating no. a torture chamber where birds can't escape each other and they're, you know, and you know, farmers will, tr will try to say, well, we're just letting them do their thing. No, you're not. You're, cre mm. you're creating a, a, a place, an enclosed area where yes. they can't escape each other. Yes. It's overpopulated and they're just raping it these hens. So yeah. It was so crowded. It was. It was virtual rape. It was that they had no, no uh, peace at all. Yeah. And often they would pick similar hens. You could tell some hens were much more um, raw and red yeah. than others. Yeah. It was... It was just uh, um, uh, horrific, yeah. and, and then and then also though then we also came across parent bird farms. Those were for the laying hens, yeah. so their offspring and they can collect the eggs. They don't like have to go in the um, in the because the, they raise them in what is it called? You meant, um, I can't think of the word. <laughs> The eggs? Yeah, where they put the eggs. What's uh, that? Room? Incubator? Incubator, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, and what, what I found out, because I would thought they have to use the eggs right away, but they collect them and put them in an ink. They can keep them for a while till they have a full incubator full. Okay. And then all those hen, all those eggs that are produced, they become barn laid, free range, and caged eggs. So that's what... It makes it so all. So they all come from the same place. They all come from the same place. And then they might go to a different farm with yes. different welfare standards. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And it all starts with pure torture, cruelty. So th there's your well, uh, there's your free range argument out the window. <laughs> totally They're coming out from the this window. Horrible breeding yes. shed. Yes. So yeah. can you imagine? After I saw that, and that's when I got so frustrated. Because to me, I always felt. Now I'm I'm trying to be open more minded to people. Um, might not know as much as we know, mm. but then when other animal groups would still promote free-range eggs, it would literally do my head in. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I understand, for and, sure. And that's the egg industry. Then there's the meat industry. Mm -hmm. So then those are the broiler birds who are killed when they're only six weeks old. Yeah. And again, where do they all come from? Because there's billions. We're talking, I think, 64 billion of these poor birds every year yeah. globally. And so then I... I met this guy that worked in a broiler, a broiler breeding parent farm. So mm -hmm. it's So they have the parent birds as well. Yep. And at his particular farm, there were uh, twelve sheds, and there were eleven with the hens, and yep. then the last one with the roosters. They started them at day old. Yep. And when they became sexually active, they started to put the roosters in with the hens, and the same thing started all over again. Yeah. And we did several rescues at these broiler parent birds and again because they're in there um for up to over a year and the 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 floors um they're like it's like a moonscape it's like the excrement gets really hard and it's and the hens are all bald they're, and they're big birds and they're so these if anyone knows a broiler bird they're the sweetest birds mm -hmm. and what we found in those sheds in the smell because they're in there the whole over a year and there again, they're getting repeatedly mated. They collect the eggs. And um, I can remember I was so traumatized by one of those sheds that I felt at the time I was just going to sit there and refuse to come out um, until something. And I wish to this day I would have done it. We did, we did get a lot of media on these places. But again, they're still there. They're still there right now. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. And, um, yeah, this is just one aspect that wasn't really talk. It's like you were talking about this 20 years ago, 
you know, mm. and, and it's still not really well known. So this is something that I want to bring to the light for people so mm. that, you know, people understand that these all, all these egg laying hens, all these broiler chicks, they come from parents who are yes. in an, in hidden sheds. And this is a very hidden aspect. And, it's a huge industry. Yeah, yeah. huge industry. Yeah. Um, I'm and, gobsmacked why the, indus- why the movement hasn't picked up on it more. I, mm. I really don't understand that. Any other aspect of... The, just the, the sexual abuse aspect, particularly in, uh, in, with other species that really disturbed you that you found out through your years? Well, I know some of the intensive piggeries we've been to where yeah. they had the boars separate, where they kept them for breeding. I didn't, we didn't actually see it, of course. This was before we had the hidden cameras. Mm-hmm. So this would have been probably in the 90s. Yeah. But I can remember um, in, in you know, the middle of the night, we have our torches. They had names above the boars, really gross, rude names. Uh, um, just, just totally um, demoralizing and yeah. disgusting names. I, can't, I won't even say them. They yeah. were just disgusting, as yeah. if making fun of the animal. And, yeah. and um, but dehu- no, not dehu- It's just pitiful. Yeah. Um, but no, we weren't privy to at the in those. We weren't privy to actually how they made it or anything. We mm-hmm. just saw that they were the boars and that they were usually caged, not caged. They were stalled all on their own and yeah. would have been a um, just a miserable life. So they only let them out maybe to to do the mating mm. or to collect their semen and then they put them back in there and. Yes. This is the early 90s, so I'm not aware of if, I don't know if they were using artificial insemination yeah, back then. just using them to, to mate and then yeah. putting them back in there. Yes, and, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and well, the dairy industry, obviously, it's built off the back of sex, uh, the, the artificial insemination. I mm. mean, they're not really using stud balls to inseminate the dairy cows, are they? It's all artificial insemination now. And um, so um, this aspect of the industry uh, I've found is a lot harder for people to debate with, right? You know, because okay. they've got the humane slaughter, and but this aspect particularly, I feel like it's creating a little bit more of a stir because it's it really is a perverse part of the industry, and without this aspect, the they, the industry kind of collapses, doesn't it? Hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think I yeah I never thought of it that way. You're probably right. People don't see it as they would. For instance, if they saw, if they thought a dog was being and bestiality or if they and there's some horrible images of mm. what they do to dogs and uh, mm. other animals for sexual gratification mm. people would they'd probably go kill these people themselves yeah. they're yeah. horrified absolutely horrified but you're right they would go and eat an egg or a chicken or a, mm. a pig and not realize they're it's no different yeah <laughs> what's happening to these um chickens and pigs and cows mm. is absolutely no different than mm. when they restrain a dog yeah in um do whatever they want which yeah. is and people don't realize that they're funding the industries that they in these practices that mm. they are morally against and when they find that out it's like wow yeah mm. so uh, a few activism events i went to one of your activism events that uh you organized it was a five-day fast mm. um it, i wanted you to talk about how you your emotional journey through those five days and how it started and how it ended can you give us a mm. little i know it was a, a, a big it was a big five days, but by the end of it, I mean, everyone was quite emotional. And can you talk about the planning process and what your sort of what you wanted to get from it and, and, and how things eventuated with that? Sure. Yeah, it was, we came across the pig, the pig slaughterhouse because we thought, I remember there's a group of us saying, let's just go to the slaughterhouses Mm. because um, this is how you could gradually evolve over your activism. Mm. Because I remember I first went through the slaughterhouses in 1980, 81. And to me, they are the, the pits. That's, the worst thing on the whole planet are slaughterhouses. Mm-hmm. And I, I thought to myself, why is it taking so long that we're focusing on the slaughterhouses? We had done one huge big lockdown at a slaughterhouse in, there was a Brisbane Meat Congress, I think it was 2006. Okay. And there was about four or five groups that got together. And we, um, I'll get to the pig slaughterhouse in yeah, a minute. Yeah, that's okay. We, we, um, we planned this all and the locals were really good, picked the slaughterhouse and we snuck in in the night and... There were four, uh, three of us from Animal Lib that we actually found the spot where they actually slit the anim- the cow's throats. And we locked ourselves to the machinery where the guy stands and slits the throat. Um, there were three of us, so we needed a fourth. So we had a really nice volunteer. And then the other groups, 
they chain themselves to the walkways, the chutes where the animals come down. Mm -hmm. So we were there, and um, that got heaps of media. Wow. This is 2006, and to me, that was my my most important moment because we were finally where we needed to be, yeah. right where they kill them, yeah. where we need to say stop, we need to shut these down. So we were there, and my son was. I was chained to this other young woman, and my son was chained to our another person on our committee, and um, I, it was just so traumatic because the workers were all up on the ledge with their white uh, uniforms on, and we so the killing hadn't started. We stopped the killing for four hours, um, and we just refused. And the owner came in and tried to talk to us at first, and I think he thought I'll talk these people out of this, and um, but he didn't because we were so. And so as the time clicked away, cause, and we had called the police too after a couple hours, and um, he eventually started to lose his temper, and he went and got an angle grinder. So he was going to cut through his own equipment to get us out, and his staff was saying, Barry, no, no, they'll go blind because we didn't have eye protection. Oh, and he was so angry. So he left again and brought us all ba back security glasses, which we put on, and my son refused to put them on. And I remember saying, Noah, put the glasses on, because we didn't want to leave. And um, he just stared the guy down, and he was live on air. It was breaking news in, in Queensland at the time. And, um, and at that point, I was thinking we had, had one of our... Uh, people call the police, but the police just were nowhere around. And we found out later the the abattoir guy had him in the tea room, giving him tea and coffee. Oh my the, god! The police. Well, the, well, this was all was happening. So he starts with his angle grinder, cutting through his own equipment, and um, and uh, one of the the other person was so upset, and um, she wasn't coping. So we then said, okay, if the police come in, we'll we'll leave. And the one thing I'll never forget is we're walking out. You know how at slaughterhouses they have all these bins everywhere? Yeah. Like, like huge big waste bins, like at the back of Coles. Yep. It was full of faces, the faces of the cows that they had skinned pulled off. off. Skinned oh off. Oh, my God. It was how a bin. Awful. Oh, I'll how never awful. forget that. And um, so that was the first time, but that was 2006. But then it was years past before... We all, I remember we, we got together, amazing activists, that, uh, we, we had a team, and we said, let's, let's go stop this pig slaughter. Why don't we just stand in front of the trucks? This was at Diamond Valley Pork. Yeah, why did you choose this particular slaughterhouse? Can you talk about that? This at particular... that point, we didn't know about the gas chambers. Oh, really? No. Okay. Um, so let me think, why did we pick that place? That's the interesting part, that we didn't have any idea about Turns the gas chambers. Turns out it's one of the most controversial... Uh, slaughterhouses <laughs> on earth now yes but um why did we, there was a reason we picked that one anyway can i think about it yeah, later and come back it comes back up that's interesting but isn't i it? think yeah. there were from memory there's a lot of photos and video of it i yeah. think there was only 10 of us and um and we went and we we had big stop signs we made a whole bunch of the, just stop yep. and peaceful nonviolent. and we stood in front of the truck right before they where those the grill comes up not in the road right there and we um we we did this you know i have to, to me it was an amazing action i thought oh my god we're doing this and we, and the police came and it was um we got media for that and blah 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 and and there was something that I can't remember why we were focusing on there, but ironically, after doing this a few times, we had a call at the office that this guy who had worked there had some information for us. So I, um, I answered him and we set up and we met at a cafe and he told me the most horrific stories of what was happening inside. And I should also say at the same time, we have some really awesome guys mm -hmm. that, it, that had come in and said, look, we're going to go in there and put in some hidden cameras. Wow. So, so we had a team of guys going in there with hidden cameras. So around the same time I was talking to this guy, I saw, had seen some of the footage yeah. of the what's gas chambers. And again, I didn't know about the gas chambers. So in the footage, I guess a lot of people have seen it. It is so horrible. Um, and so I'm sitting with this cafe and with this guy and because he didn't know that I knew what I knew. So it confirmed what I, f I felt that he was genuinely telling me all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And he was, everything he said was matched by what we were finding with the hidden cameras. Mm -hmm. But then I remember he said to me, um, one of his, he was a manager with the, um, 
I guess, with the electrical division uh-huh. there. So he wasn't a slaughterman or anything. And he said he was, he got so upset because he didn't, he quit sh- shortly after. He went, went, they had to clean the pits underneath the gas chambers. Okay. And so he went there and was telling his guys. And when they lifted um, the grill or whatever, it was full of hooves that wow. the pigs would have been so frantic and so terrified they actually ripped their own feet, feet off. off. Oh, I just thought, oh, I was just, like I, when I saw Diana's footage, I just thought, oh, my God. And that sort of melded, it became really important to me to get that place out there and to stop it. Mm. Um, and that's when we started regular um, big stoppages there. In, well, we focused, we had a few, but December, every December we'd do it. And the fast that you started the question with, the f- five-day fast, was part of that when we had done it four years in a row we decided because again you had to get something else for media attention we thought mm-hmm. well let's fast yeah so that's how the fast came about and this particular slaughterhouse that was the world first uh gas chamber footage uh that anyone had ever seen yeah no there was um d- um Aussie Farms had done something at Korowa Piggery, okay. which we had also been in 30 years ago. Okay. That's one. Of, that's the biggest piggery in the Southern Hemisphere. And they have since we started going rescues there, they've built a slaughterhouse on site. Okay. And they use the gas chamber as well. Okay. And, um, that's Aussie where the Fa- first footage originally... Yes, yeah, they, okay. they um, did the first one. And it was around the same time we were doing it down here in Melbourne, ironically. Yeah. It was yeah. um, virtually the same time. And... Then when we released the footage, and I remember when the when he saw the footage, he couldn't believe that we had actually gotten in there and gotten footage of what he was talking about. Wow! And the RSPCA were calling this humane, weren't they, before the footage uh, yeah, was released? Yeah, they were all RSPCA approved. Yeah. And we did a huge um, campaign against their Otway pork that was endorsed by the RSPCA. Yep. Horrible conditions at their at their Otway pork farms, mm-hmm. and that was their um, what do you call it their poster child the rspca yeah. we changed all their little gimmicks and little uh, we to show what was really at at these properties mm-hmm. and we followed one of the trucks one night we at once the truck went out and we followed it all the way to otway to dvp so we knew they were being killed there mm-hmm. but now a lot so many pigs are killed at, at dvp mm-hmm. so we knew it was, oh, that's why we picked that slaughterhouse. <laughs> uh-huh. Yes, because we followed that truck that night, and that's where it went. So we were going to connect that up with our Otway Pork campaign. Okay. That's how that all started. Wow. And so you can imagine as the things all cha- evolved and changed, how we put more and more pieces together. And the year before the fast, we were on the roof. There were 12 of us up on the roof, and four of our people were chained to the, to the gas chamber, to the entrance and they, yeah. we, so we stopped the killing that time. That was the year before the fast. I get it. Yeah, and I, that I remember had, that. Yeah, that had heaps of media. And was I, Noah chained Noah into was, the gas Noah chamber? Noah was chained into yeah. the gas chamber with um, <laughs> the kittens with, on the table. Yeah, here. now he's starting to. to <laughs> oh, um, yeah, four of them were chained, and mm-hmm. there were twelve of us on the roof. They had to get the SES to get us down. Mm-hmm. And that was so. Then the next year, we that's when we had the um, the five day fast. the five day fast, and we were blown away with that because uh, we knew we'd have a bit of um, opposition. But they had a hundred police officers there yeah. every single day. It was they had big tents set up in the car park where the workers are. They had, the police had their tents set up, yeah. their permanent tents. It was just um, unbelievable. Yeah, and that's the most police I've seen at a vigil to this date. And mm-hmm. they were, and like that, that symbolic of it's so symbolic of the the police protecting corporations mm-hmm. who are doing something which is inherently evil, mm-hmm. and the activists on the other side of the police tr- trying to change the way things are. Yeah, mm-hmm. and peacefully, and with you know, so many people were crying. You know, people were so emotional. Yeah. Um, there were only about twenty people fasting, so they were very emotional. Yeah. But every every activist there, we. We had some days over 100 activists. I think one day we had almost 150, some days less. But um, but to me, the iconic image that came out of any image in my whole over 40 years of animal activism was the big pig truck coming in. They brought it in the other way from where we were, and they had about 80 police officers side by side 
protecting the truck yeah. with these poor the pigs are only six months when they're killed in those yeah. gas chambers they're yeah. still they're Babies. like teenagers yeah or young kids yeah. and that image will never leave my mind it was mm. it was a double decker big truck full of, and those police just and we were just um a, a group of concerned people that mm. just didn't want to see all this suffering and the uh, police pulling the activists off of the truck mm, really oh. they it's like almost towards the end the police were getting more physical and pulling peeling activists yes. off the truck and it, it was strange because some active some police got really really violent and nasty mm. and others had tears and would mm. you could tell they didn't want to do what they were mm. doing mm. so it's sort of like the whole population but i think history will prove that what these group of people we're trying to do that again. There's n- never any violence. We're so peaceful. We're, yeah. we're such peaceful. I think history will prove that. Um, especially as, like I said, there were probably as many police that you felt were not happy with what they were doing as the ones that got really, well, the really nasty ones were fewer, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. they were nasty. Yeah. They would be really. They would pinch and pull and yeah. be really hard. But uh, but the majority just did their job and yeah. then there were those that were in tears yeah because uh, some activists were showing the police the footage from inside that particular mm. slaughterhouse and that yes. was affecting the police as well the actual gas chamber where these mm. pigs are put three in a um a gondola yeah. a gondola and lowered into gas and they they just thrash and cream they and the the worker that i had had the tea the met up at the cafe he said to me patty they're enlarging it they're going to put in bigger chambers and it's going to quadruple the amount of pigs they kill. And he was right. Yeah. So then I Googled, uh, and, and they brought in the system they use in the UK, where instead of three in a gondola, they have like a, a room full that they just push the door in, yeah. and they can kill four, five times more pigs. So that was all in progress. See, that was another reason why we were so determined to get the public outraged at all this before they built this yep. this part of the piggery but it, no it's there it's there it's there Still there well and it was an amazing action that particular one and because uh you've seen such a transition in the movement you've seen such a change like do you now have uh, more hope than you once did like you i guess you're walking into supermarkets you're seeing the change you're seeing all these young activists and you've been you know how long you've been an activist for 40 years being an animal rights mm. person and now you're starting to see this knock-on effect yes. and how does that make you feel <laughs> oh fantastic i can remember a time um forget maybe around the turn of the century where i was so exhausted in those times i've had probably 10 major burnouts where yeah. you just you just go 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 and then you mm. just stop yeah. but then you, you get back up again but i can remember at one point thinking where are all the young people where are they come yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and now they're flooding there's so many amazing activists all around the world mm. that are um chaining themselves in slaughterhouses that you know they're doing what needs to be yeah, done yeah. and it's not just a few here and there it's global yeah and like you said the supermarkets are full of vegan products i think if anything climate the, what's happening to our climate yeah. and how it's breaking down is mother earth coming to the aid of the animals yeah. as well there's no yeah. doubt about that's in my mind once as that progresses, that's going to push things real quick. <laughs> yeah, they're, connect- they're so connected, aren't they, climate change oh, and so animal connected. rights? And the climate change is an impending sense of doom for humanity. So if they don't change that aspect yes. of it, and you know, if they change their diet, then that's a lot of the animal exploitation that will change as well. Mm. It's a pity it's not... They're not doing it for moral, ethical reasons, but um, and that's what we want. But as long as they do it, that's the, to me that's number one. Shut down these slaughterhouses mm. and and animal agriculture. That was a big step for us too. When we never said the word factory farm, and when I heard it, I said, "Don't say that. Yeah. Say animal agriculture." Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Those were s- steps from going welfare to abolition mm. to factory farming to animal agriculture. To me, those are the big steps, and that um, are. And it's where we're at today and it's what has to happen. Wow. Yeah. So I just want to say thank you so much for all of your work. I'm sure you've got 20 podcasts worth of stories <laughs> to do, but thank you for everything that you've done and you've paved the way you really have. And to stay in the movement so long and so strong, it's yeah. just a real inspiration and 
Oh, I'm one of many. There's so yeah. many. All these things I'm talking about, it was a whole team. It was a whole team. Yeah, definitely a whole team. Amazing people out there. And thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. The more people that we educate, the better. Yeah. And do you have any last words for uh, animal activists? Or let's yeah, let's just say, give your um, words of wisdom to animal activists. I mean, it's, it's a hard road and, you know, there's ups and downs. And, mm. you know, you said you were ostracized right at the start and... You got through that. Do you have any any words to... That was sort of in the middle section. In the middle when, section. When we jumped from welfare to abolition. Oh, you then were, we were ab- yeah, yeah. But now that's not an issue because most activists are abolitionists. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But some people might face being ostracized from their family for being oh, vegan. Oh, definitely. And, you know, like, that happened too, yeah. Do you have any advice for um, animal rights activists? Yeah, or, you if know, vegan I had act- to do it all over again, I reckon a lot of my energy that I would definitely change was arguing or disagreeing with other activists. Yeah. I would say, let it go, even though it can real, like I said, I'd get so frustrated if other groups would promote free range eggs yeah. when I saw where they came from. Yeah. And that took up so much of my energy because I was, conv- I was determined I'd let these, no, we have to do it this way. Yeah. Let that all go as hard as it is. Put your blinkers on, know what's in your heart and just do it and don't care what anybody else says or doesn't say if you have it in your heart and you'll sorry it's you'll okay. know you will know and and then do what needs to be done mm-hmm. as long as it's as long as it's nonviolent yeah. I'm, I'm i'm i mean I'm, yeah, I'm nonviolent, but it, I mean, I would step in if somebody was killing some um, oh, I don't know. Yeah. I'm nonviolent. Yeah. But don't let what other people say or do or criticize we we need to work together more there's so few of us that's the other thing we're all um i think we i don't know how we think this we're still a few grains of of sand on the beach there's so many um what is it almost we're 7.5 billion people we're only a handful so even if you can't work together with someone else it, it, forget it and go your go down your path yeah. and do it as hard and as as um, ethically and as passionately as you can. Yeah, that's what the animals. That's need. what I like about you. You're passionate. <laughs> <laughs> and you know the infighting can have people leaving the movement, and that's not what the animals need. So stay yeah. focused on yes why you're doing this and yes because it's not about us. No, and um it's not about oh we should have done this. It's not about arguing with each other. It's about it's pic, picture it like there's been a, a, a tsunami and you just are, that's how I feel when I go into the sheds. I get so nervous. Mm. I'm one of these people, if I double park, I break into a sweat. But and to get out of the rescue van, into the shed, in the night, through the barbed wire, I am so scared and nervous. The minute I'm in the shed, nothing ever can stop me. Mm. I don't care. How, you just get to work because you yeah. see all these animals suffering. That's how we have to look at it as a whole movement. Not about us. Focus on those animals and what we need to do to help them. But keeping in mind, look after yourself as well Thank to last you. the distance. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think we're going to leave that there. Thank okay. you so much, Patty. Thank you. Okay. Wow. No. God, you didn't even have me crying there. <laughs> Thank you so oh, much. That's okay. Thank you. It's uh, hard. It is hard, isn't it? Yeah, it is hard. Thank you. That was a beautiful yeah. conversation. Oh, really thank inspiring. You. <laughs>